Chief Justice of the Louisiana Supreme Court, the Honorable Bernadette Johnson. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker. To first to President Alario and to Speaker Barre, uh, members of the Senate and House of Representatives, colleagues, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's, it's my honor and privilege to be here today to visit with you and, and we certainly thank you for this invitation to address you on the state of the judiciary. I know uh, you have a lot on your legislative agenda and uh, especially in light of the flooding in the Monroe area and northern areas of the state. I, I'm hearing in Sabine and other areas uh, uh, the Sabine River flooding uh, over in the Lake Charles area. And so I appreciate that, that uh, uh, you are here, the ones who could get here to uh, hear this address today. Uh, President Alario has already introduced my colleagues who are here today. I did want to note that Justice Knoll will be retiring from the court at the end of 2016 after two decades on the Louisiana Supreme Court. She's served 30 years in the judiciary and she's now in her victory lap. Justice Knoll is a distinguished jurist and she's left an indelible mark on Louisiana jurisprudence and we will certainly miss her but I wanted to recognize her today. On behalf of the justices, let me extend Congratulations to those newly elected legislators in House and Senate. And we also want to thank uh, those veteran le legislators. Uh, congratulate you on your reelection and thank you for all the work that you've done on behalf of the judiciary. We know this has been a tough special session dealing with uh, budget deficits here in the state. Our respective two branches of government have a history of mutual respect and cooperation, and it is my goal as Chief Justice to do everything that I can to continue that, to build upon this relationship. I believe that mutual respect of our two branches is based upon a recognition that the legislature and the judiciary are two separate but equal branches of government. Both our federal and state constitution enshrine the principle of separation of co-equal powers, a principle which is meaningless and ineffective without maintenance of an independent judiciary. Although judges in this state are elected, our allegiance is owed to the Louisiana Constitution and to the rule of law and not to the rule of the majority. It is the duty and the responsibility of each judge in this state to apply the Constitution and laws to the facts before him or her without fear or favor. A judge cannot be partisan, despite which way political winds may blow. An independent judiciary is a hallmark of our democracy, and we should take whatever steps are necessary to respect and preserve this independence. This morning, I have the opportunity to speak to you on the state of the judiciary. I'm pleased to bring with me today, hot off the press, copies of our 2015 annual report, and I think we have provided a copy to each member of the legislature. Our annual report includes basic information on our state judiciary, as well as an annual statistical compilation of case filings at all levels of court. It also includes updates and discussions of court activities and related entities such as our Office of the Judicial Administrator, the Louisiana Law Library, the Judicial College, the Judiciary Commission of Louisiana that disciplines and can remove judges, the Louisiana Attorney Disciplinary Board which 
uh, disciplines lawyers, and our Committee on Bar Admissions. The annual report is prepared in hard copy form, but we do want to let you know it's available in electronic form at the Supreme Court website. The Judicial Council. The annual report is prepared under the auspices of the Judicial Council, and it is the research, research arm for the court composed of 17 members representing the judiciary, the legislature, the bar, and citizens of Louisiana. Uh, incidentally, in case you should know this, Senator Dan Clater and Representative Frank Foyle are your current representatives on the Judicial Council. The Council has several standing committees that report to the legislat legislature regularly, and chief among them are the committees that deal with new judgeships and our standing committee to recommend court costs and fees. Both of these committees were established in response to the legislature's request that the council review requests for new judgeships and the splitting and merging of courts or requests for new or increased court costs. These committees play an active role in assisting the legislature when bills regarding the structure of the judiciary or the need for new increased costs are presented. I'd like to highlight and specifically refer you to the information that's included on our budget. In addition to this budget information, copies of our most recent judiciary appropriations bill and the legislative audit, audit can be found online on our court's website. Further, our budget request for upcoming fiscal year 2016-2017 has been filed as House Bill 616, and that is available online on the legislature's website. Please be reminded that the Judiciary Appropriations Bill does not include funding for the entire state judicial system. The Louisiana court system is not a, a unified system. It's not totally state funded. Uh, there is no one overarching budget for state courts. The judicial branch is funded through multiple sources, including funds appropriate by the state legislature, but also funds from local governing bodies, self-generated revenue from fines and fees and court costs, and also we rely on federal grants. The budget prepared and presented to you annually for operating the court system, the Supreme Court, the Courts of Appeal, it provides salaries uh, and uh, retirement benefits for all state judges. Uh, but the budget does not include uh, funding for all of the other operations of those state courts. We've always utilized state appropriated funds in a prudent manner. We've actively sought and obtained significant federal funding to assist our courts. And I believe we have done an excellent job. We've been excellent stewards of the public fisc, especially considering that we are able to effectively and efficiently operate a third branch of government with state appropriations totaling less than 1% of the total state budget. And I'll refer you to your uh, annual report that we just passed out, if you have it in hand, page 11 of that report shows how much money uh, you uh, have to allocate and, and uh, uh, in terms of all of our operations. Page 11 of our annual report shows that the judiciary receives less than 1% of state funding, in fact, 0.63%. So we think we've been prudent in terms of the monies uh, allocated for the judiciary. We rely on you uh, to provide those funds for uh, salaries for judges and other necessary pieces. It enables the state judiciary to fulfill its constitutionally mandated duties to resolve disputes and also allows us 
to continue to work for reforms and improvements in the area of judicial administration. Uh, we, we are aware of the budget crisis fa facing this state. We all live here. And I commend you for your courage uh, that you def demonstrated uh, in tackling uh, the difficult budget issues in the special session. We know you have many challenges ahead during this regular session. And I just wanted to point out to you uh, that we do have a particular concern with regard to indigent defense. Approximately 85% of all criminal defendants are represented by public defenders. And it is our constitutional obligation to provide adequate representation. We cannot try um, felony cases, cases where folks are subject to imprisonment at hard labor without them having an attorney. And while this is not usually considered a cost-saving meth method, if we fail to provide adequate counsel at the outset, uh, we will not be able to avoid those exorbitant costs associated with reversal and retrial of cases. Our indigent defender system is funded through a combination of state appropriations, I think something like $33 million last year. Also, this system receives proceeds from traffic tickets and court fees. Unfortunately, we're learning that the revenues from traffic tickets have decreased dramatically, and we know that state funds have been slashed. As a result, the public defender has notified me and others that 33 of the state's 42 judicial districts are presently operating under restriction of services, and they predict that half the public defender offices in the state will be insolvent within months. So we're all concerned with budget cuts on the system. Uh, in the area of legal representation and child support cases, that commission was recently advised that due to reductions in funding, uh, for the State Defender Board, state funding for provision of legal services to indigent parents would soon cease. These planned cuts to funding and services not only threaten the constitutional and legal rights of parties in abuse and, ne and neglect cases, they put Louisiana at risk of losing millions in federal child welfare funds. I mentioned that our state courts are partially funded by collection of costs and fees. These costs and fees are generated by the state, uh, by the local uh, uh, entity, usually the police jury or, or the city, and it differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Although the Office of the Legislative Auditor includes a review of court cost collections in its regular audits, at this time there is no composite inventory of what costs are being accept, assessed by courts. It differs across the spectrum and across the state. As a problem when people without means to pay criminal fines and fees face disproportionate rates of incarceration. And this issue has been publicly highlighted in two lawsuits in the state and federal courts as well as in a recent publication by the ACLU entitled Louisiana's Debtor's Prison, An Appeal to Justice. For defendants who are released on their own recognizance on ROR bonds or unsecured bonds, these folk uh, have no problem, but the ones who are not able to post bail, usually with regard to low-level crimes, they're being held in jail simply because of their poverty and their inability to pay. In the lawsuit in Ascension Parish, Snow against Lambert, a, a settlement agreement was reached in that case to address these critical issues by eliminating preset bail for misdemeanor arrests. The agreement prohibits any misdemeanor defendant 
from being held in jail after arrest on a secured money bond that the defendant cannot afford. In response to the settlement in Snow, many state and local courts have chosen to voluntarily address the constitutional concerns presented by preset bail schedules. We've made an attempt to learn uh, more about costs and fees, and uh, in that regard, we've charged the Judicial Council Standing Committee on Court Costs to gather information. We've asked the committee to study the use of court costs and fees for the operational needs of the judicial system and to develop and recommend best practices. The committee recommended the creation of a transparent public database listing all required and optional fines and fees, the creation of an effective system for tracking assessed and collected fees, and the development of best practices for collecting fees. I'm happy to report to you that we have received a grant from the State Justice Institute, I think it's something like $50,000 to fund our efforts to study fines and fees. And this hopefully will be the starting point for making sure that we have a system that's fair to all of our citizens. Work on this project is already underway and I understand that the Judicial Council will be recommending to the legislation, legislat legislature the imposition of a short-term moratorium on costs and fees except for exigent circumstances so that we can report to you um, uh, how we can address this issue. Mass incarceration. I, I rarely uh, make a speech these days without talking about mass incarceration and I repeat uh, numbers that everyone knows as well as I do. Um, the United States leads the world and the number of people we incarcerate and Louisiana leads the country. We are number one in the nation in the number of people we lock up. We spend over six hundred million dollars on state corrections. That's the fiscal year 2014-2015 budget. In Louisiana, 86 adult Louisianians, one in 86 adult Louisianians is behind bars which is nearly twice the national average. Um, we lock up more people than Iran, five times more than Iran, 13 times more than China, 20 times more than Germany, and I guess it wouldn't matter except that it costs us money. Like I said, about $600 million. And we have to ask ourselves, in a, in a state where we believe our natural resources are oil and gas and, and other. Our, our greatest resource is really our people. And, and if we uh, are focused on uh, our people and, and, and developing uh, uh, generations of folk to come so that they have job opportunities uh, and instead of locking them up, then of course we won't lead the nation. There's a connection between incarceration and poverty. We're also the poorest state in the nation. And so someone finally has to make the, the uh, connection. Well, if we have the, if we number one in locking people up and we number one in terms of poverty, maybe there's a connection there. In May of 2015, I convened a meeting of over 50 stakeholders to discuss evidence-based solutions to over incarceration and at that meeting, Bill Hubbard, who is the past president of the American Bar Association, led the discussion about the importance of developing legislation and policy aimed at implementing alternatives to incarceration for low-level offenders. Nobody's trying to get murderers and rapists and armed robbers out of jail. We're talking about low-level offenders. Reducing the length of excessive criminal sentences and providing meaningful pathways back to work in society for returning citizens. Mr. Hubbard discussed how South Carolina, this isn't New York, uh, California, but South Carolina 
passed omnibus legislation that has already begun to significantly reduce the prison population while also influencing a reduction in violent crime. These legislative reforms are estimated to save the state of South Carolina $350 million. Pretrial services, without a doubt, uh, we know um, uh, this over-incarceration is detrimental, so what can we do? We have several initiatives underway, and one of them looks at pretrial services. Re research shows that pretrial detainees account for more than 60% of the U.S. inmate population at a cost of an estimated $9 billion. Public safety is undermined when space is used for low-level offenders, and uh, rather than uh, maintaining prison beds for uh, serious offenders. I believe that a comprehensive solution to Louisiana's over-incarceration must include statewide pretrial services, and they are models uh, available for us. We sent a team recently to Kentucky to learn about that state's highly successful statewide pretrial services program. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel, and when another state has done it and done it well, and they can show us the way, then we need to take advantage of it, and that's why we are uh, looking to uh, Kentucky and South Carolina for some of these um, changes that we want to make. I want to emphasize for you the work of our specialty courts because this is one of the shining success stories of the collaboration between our two branches of government. And we thank you for uh, House Bill 216, uh, House Resolution 216, which you passed last year, which commends the work of the Louisiana Supreme Court Drug Court Office. In 2001, the legislature allocated funds which enabled the Supreme Court to establish a drug court office to, to provide oversight and standards to our newly established drug courts. In 2015, there were 50 operational drug court programs. Of those 50 programs, 30 are adult drug courts, 17 juvenile drug courts, and th three deal with family preservation. 50 of these courts have been in operation for more than 10 years. National re research shows that 80% of offenders abuse alcohol or drugs. Almost 50% of inmates are clinically addicted. Approximately 60% of arrestees test positive for drugs at arrest. So our drug courts address this problem by offering an effective alternative to incarceration. Our drug courts are, success, are successful, and we have the statistical data to prove it. Our drug courts reduce incarceration rates. In Louisiana, three years post-graduation, 89.8% of these people who finish these programs have no new criminal convictions for a recidivism rate of 10.2%, something we should be proud of. Nationally, research has shown significant re reductions in recidivism for participants in drug programs compared to folk who are sentenced to con conventional justice intervention. And for each dollar invested in, a, in the drug courts, the state receives a benefit of $3.36 through reduced recidivism, decreased victimization costs, decreased medical costs, and increased worker productivity. Even more impressive is the fact that 49 drug-free babies were born to drug court participants uh, since the inception of the program. Uh, and we, it's been uh, since two, 2001, we've had 593 drug-free babies. And that's a tremendous cost, a whopping $148 million that we don't have to spend on medical uh, and related expenses for babies born addicted. 
we've seen increased interest in Louisiana in reentry courts. Uh, the the, the uh, premise is that if we can provide training for uh, offenders while they're incarcerated, we will reap uh, benefits. We've got several reentry courts. Each reentry judge identifies the participant and screens them. They assess to determine the risk of res recidivism and then placed in an appropriate training program. The Department of Corrections uh, Secretary, Mr. James LeBlanc, is dedicated to reentry, and currently there are 16 vocational training programs offered at Angola. Autom automotive repair, welding, electrical refrigeration, air conditioning repair. The inmate is trained in these areas uh, while they're incarcerated. They provided counseling, and, uh, and at the end of that, they can test for certification. If successful, uh, upon release, this inmate has the potential to earn as much as $75,000 a year. Of course, a key component to this is the placement of the offender in a job, and, uh, and, and that's, that's key. Uh, we have eight courts now around the state, and currently I know there's some other folk who are interested in starting uh, reentry courts. Two of them that are very successful, uh, Judge Laurie White and Judge Arthur Hunter of New Orleans, recently received national recognition in the ABA Journal about their efforts in reentry courts. The recidivation, recidivism rates for participants uh, is far less, but of course we're just starting the process and we want to be able to bring you uh, good statistics uh, to show uh, the result over time. Some of them are still in the pipeline and still, still receiving training in their various areas at Angola. Uh, but in recognition of the potential that this reentry model presents, we've assigned Judge Rusty Knight from the 22nd JDC to coordinate the efforts of drafting best practices and standards for reentry court, court uh, much like the drug court model. Nationwide, we've seen an increase in, uh, in um, uh, specialty courts. Uh, I recently uh, attended a meeting for the Conference of Chief Justices in Washington, D.C., where Judge Steve Leafman, who's a, ju a, a judge in Dade County, Florida, he received the prestigious Rehnquist Award in recognition of his great strides with mental health courts. And we are in the process of gathering information on the Florida model. Judge Leafman has been able to work out the kind of arrangement with health and human resources where he can move people from his court into hospital beds. And as a result, Dade County, Florida has closed an entire prison, I think that about a thousand beds. Another successful spe specialty court I wanted to mention to you today uh, is one operated by Chief Judge Desiree Honore, I'm sorry, Chief Judge Desiree Charbonnet uh, with uh, Orleans Municipal Court. She was highlighted in the Atlantic magazine for putting together a diver diversion program for women charged with prostitution. This crossroads program aims to break the cycle of prostitution, arrest, and incarceration by offering support services, health care, housing, job training, counseling. We'd rather have them uh, stabilized and not in our, our prisons and not uh, revolving through our court system. We owe a debt of gratitude to those judges because uh, you pay their salary Every state judge receives the same state salary. The ones who do all of this extra work get not, an, not another dime. They don't get a, another dime added to their salary as a, re a result of all the extra work they take on in all of these specialty courts. I'm looking forward to serving on the Louisiana Justice Reinvestment Task Force, which you created last year under 
H, uh, HCR 82. The task force has been charged with studying the state's adult criminal justice system with an eye toward reducing inmate populations, expanding research-based supervision and sentencing practices, and reinvesting savings to reduce recidivism and improve reentry outcome. Another initiative which affects uh, our justice system uh, is the issue of juvenile uh, jurisdiction. Uh, Senator uh, Morrell has a bill 324 that seeks to raise the age of juvenile court jurisdiction from 17 to 18. We have a hiatus where 18 year olds are majors, 17 year olds are technically minors still, but they are thrown into the adult system because the way our legislation reads now, uh, juvenile court has no jurisdiction over 17 year olds. Uh, we will be bringing you some information on that. I, I think uh, uh, the material I've been presented seems to show that the cost of taking them through the juvenile court system rather than adult uh, will be a savings for the state. Uh, there, there already is a mechanism to transfer violent offenders, 15, 16, 17 year olds to state court, state district court, and so this would not impact those violent crimes. On other initiatives, we're in the process of implementing a state-of-the-art case management system in our clerk's office. Uh, last year, I signed an order creating an access to justice commission, and it would take too long for me to tell you all of the things we've accomplished with access to justice. I did want to mention with regard to uh, civil legal, legal services that Louisiana is one of only three states that uh, provide zero funding for civil uh, legal services. The legal services corporations, they are fully funded by just state, uh, by just federal funding and whatever other resources they can hobble together. Our judicial college is planning a year strategic planning and continuing to improve, improve the quality of judicial education for our state judges. I might also mention that we suffered a great loss with the untimely death of Professor Cheney Joseph, who was named Executive Director Emeritus of the Louisiana Judicial College. I know Professor Joseph taught many of you who were lawyers uh, at LSU Law School, and his contributions to Louisiana criminal law are immeasurable. I refer you to the annual report for additional information on the court's year in, a, in review. As I, as I conclude, uh, I do want to comment on the history of co cooperation and collaboration between our two branches of government. Uh, the court pledges to continue that cooperation and open lines of communication and mutual respect. In conclusion, let me say again what an honor and a privilege it is for the justices of the Supreme Court to be allowed to uh, present this state of the judiciary today. We greatly appreciate your hospitality. I look forward to working with you uh, and stand ready to assist where appropriate. And on behalf of the judiciary, I thank President Alario, Speaker Barre, all of you who are dedicated members of the state legislature for opening your chambers to us today, for your attention to my remarks, and for your unfailing devotion to the people of the state of Louisiana. Thank you. The main message for Louisiana is our rates of incarceration. We 
are number one in the nation in the terms of in terms of the number of people that we lock up and we have to be smarter. Our budget uh, for uh, Department of Corrections is over six hundred million dollars and if we can make a difference there we're not only saving lives but we're also saving money for the state of Louisiana. You mentioned there are several alternatives to incarceration. The uh, judges are doing a really great job in regard to reentry. We have some judges who uh, have put together a program at Angola State Penitentiary where they provide training uh, while these men are incarcerated and uh, when they uh, leave they can uh, receive certification in air conditioning repair and other uh, fields and earn something like $75,000 a year. And that's what we want. We want uh, to reduce the recidivism rate. We want to provide job opportunities. We want people to have jobs and support their families and pay taxes. What about uh, the success of drug courts in Louisiana? We've had tremendous success with over 50 drug courts uh, for over 10 years. And so it's a model uh, that we'll be using with our reentry courts. In conclusion, what would you like people to keep in mind about the role of the judiciary in Louisiana? Uh, that we have good judges in this state who work hard. Uh, they, 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 uh, the ones who involve in all of these specialty courts uh, receive, the, receive the same state salary as every other judge. They don't receive an extra dime of uh, compensation, and we always want to let judges know we appreciate the hard work they do in Louisiana.